to find out how Tara's got on. Our wildlife expert Ellie Harrison is uh, is with us. It's not just pets, is it, at this time of year? No, it, the wildlife is affected by fire, fireworks. There's um, not a lot of scientific evidence, but there's anecdotal evidence that birds and mammals are affected by the loud fireworks. They can be over 100 decibels, and they get really quite disorientated and upset by them. One woman even reported that a badger drowned in her pond after fireworks night, and that's not obviously ideal. Um, the, I mean, without being a massive party pooper, if you can avoid going for the louder ones and go for the really pretty ones, and don't have displays near trees because there'll be birds roosting there, that can really help wildlife. Any petrified pets in your house, Ben? Uh, yeah, we have a, a little dog, and I think she was quite uh, scared last year. I'm, I'm with you on the volume. I, I, I think for our own pleasure, it's the ones that do the big bang, I think, that scare, scare the animals, and frankly, they're my least favourite. I like, I, we like the displays. So I, I guess uh, avoid the uh, the enormous uh, bang ones. That would be. But aren't your device. kids terrified when the babies? I can't tell you how many times I took my terrified little baby out of the car, just trembling with fear. Oh. It's like there's a That's war you, going it's on not outside. The fireworks. I mean, <laughs> they're just. <laughs> Dad, imagine Daddy, your mum looming over you when you're a few months old. <laughs> you might be right there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we got some um, some tips did, from yeah, uh, we've got uh, some lots of, of different emails. This one's from uh, Tracy Spratt in London. She bought a puppy and decided to take him into the garden along with her children. And as the fireworks went off, they cheered and clapped to show the little pup that it was all good and that the, yeah. the dog should be happy and, and content. Anne Blees in Devon said her dachshund Millie loves fireworks. I suppose because their belly's close to the ground. They're just further away <laughs> from the noise, aren't they? So, uh... Well, if you want to find out more about Sarah's techniques or if you've got any stories you'd like to share, then go to the website at bbc.co.uk slash The One Show. Uh, Ellie's here for more than fireworks. As usual, Ellie would like a guide from you on what wildlife we should be watching this month. What have you been watching? Some sort of smut, really. <laughs> <laughs> as much innuendo as we can get in the animal world. Yeah. Um, red deers are uh, they're going through the rut. The, the stags are going through the rutting season. It's been going on for a month or so now, but it's a very spectacular display. OK. Let's take a look at it then. Ellie was keen for a closer look at this magnificent spectacle, and she knew exactly where to go to. The southwest of England is home to the largest population of red deer outside Scotland. So I've come to Exmoor at the crack of dawn to observe one of our most established and ancient herds. November is the mating season or rut, making it the best time of year to see this most British of wildlife spectacles. hoping to get a glimpse of the stags at this crucial time of year, so I've arranged to meet up with Exmoor Ranger, Richard Eels. How close am I likely to be able to get? Well, red deer on Exmoor are truly wild, right. so they have a, they're quite twitchy. Mm -hmm. you, um, you have to be quiet, look for signs of them, approach from downwind if you can. And I'm hoping we can find a herd, because they're rutting at the moment, that we can get fairly close to today. Do you find it an exciting time of the year? It's the best time of year for red deer on Exmoor. Yeah. Really, absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Um, I love it. The rut lasts about four weeks over October and November. During this time, the larger stags round up as many hinds or females as they can, but there's a constant battle for pecking order as the younger rival stags try to claim hinds for themselves. If you know where to look, evidence of the rut isn't too hard to find. So this is what we call a wallow. You can see there's a lot of deer slots leading into it, slots yeah. being their footprints, mm -hmm. and um, it leads to this big muddy puddle in the middle. And what happens is it gets it all nice and muddy and wet, and then you can see these smoothed off edges where the stag's been rolling in it and spreading his scent all over his body. In order to attract females, the red stag about town has a rather pungent trick up his sleeve. They urinate in here, so you can, you can have a smell of that. That's quite pokey. Well, that's the stag equivalent of cologne and Beautiful. makes them more acceptable to all the ladies. Smells really important as well, isn't it, for the hinds, because by smelling them, the, the stag can tell when they're ready. Yes, it's more a case of when they're urinating, he'll put his head down and you'll see him curl his lip up and show all his top teeth. And um, yeah, if the hind's ready, then he'll, she'll stand and he'll serve her. Juvenile males reach sexual maturity from around two years old. And during the rut, they will often attempt to mate with hinds much older than themselves. So he's up and about. He's, he obviously fancies his chances here. 
This young stag clearly has designs on a lone hind. Well, what was all that about? Basically, it's full of testosterone, and obviously the hind's a lot more dominant, and it's just her way of saying no. No chance. Bit of a box, on your way, and I think she got her message across loud and clear. I think she did. He is, unfortunately, not the uh, big brute of a stag yeah. that she's looking for. <laughs> Who can blame her? <laughs> joined now by Ellie and uh, Ian Maguire, a, an owl handler, and we've got a couple of tawny owls, fantastic. Ben sitting here with his hand over his groin exactly, there. Exactly, so they are birds of prey and I offer a tempting portion. <laughs> uh, goodness gracious. <laughs> <laughs> They're extraordinary, so, so beautiful. Fantastic. Uh, Listen, uh, owls. Don't, there we go. Just a bit of a flap. He's got his, uh, is he all right there? Yeah. She? Fine. Yeah, she's fine. She. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, some, don't get jealous owls because we've got some other birds, some inferior birds to talk about first. Ellie, what else can we look out for? Absolutely. We've got some birds that are overwintering in the UK. Thrushes like Redwing and Fieldfare come down from Scandinavia and they can, they can flock in their hundreds and they really have a go at our hedgerows and, and chow down on as many berries as they can get. And they're really spectacular to see in winter to see birds in that And number. swans as well. Swans as well. Buick and Huber swans. Um, Buick come down from Siberia and the Huber ones come from Iceland and they they're seen in our estuaries around this time of year as well and of course tawny owls which Ian's holding over yeah. there um, at this time of year they're they're defending their territories and they're finding nests and mates oh. Whoops. Oh. there we go <laughs> 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 and uh, they, they make that classic twit true sound at this That's time right. of year if, so why well. is November time and indeed well, there you go there there you it might in call yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 why is November kind of so important look at this thing yeah. go. go and coming into winter time as well for owls well, the tawny owl is a territorial owl, so although they're normally associated with woodlands, um, they're also a city owl. Um, and um, so when we get through to this time of year, they're defending their territories, they're, you've got the resident pairs that are saying to all the other owls, keep away from us, you can't live here, and they're all coming in saying, you know, we want somewhere to live. So there's a lot of activity and that's when people hear them. Okay, are you settled enough there, Ben? <laughs> I, I, it really, it's, it's wonderful like to be this owls? close. Yeah. Well, I, I, they're, they're extraordinarily beautiful and, uh, and my goodness, what a flap the wind. <laughs> They create. Yeah. Old Jazzy did a monumental whoopsie. <laughs> this this yeah. one yeah. actually did a poo just beside Ellie. Didn't we? we nearly had a Blue Peter moment. <laughs> but, uh, it was just before the camera. She's good at that. When you, um, there's, there's a danger, isn't there, at this time of the year, with our little, the baby owls falling out of the nests, so you've got to be careful. Well, every spring we've got an issue with tawny owl chicks. It's where in the spring. In okay, the yeah. spring. Um, they're early breeders compared to the other owls, yeah. but there is the, they, they branch. They leave the nest site after three or four weeks, and then they go up into the trees, but sometimes they fall down, and there's an issue with people finding them and assuming they're orphans. And they pick them up, take them home, feed them, and they became tame, become tame. You can't so release them. So what should them. you do? You should... What you should do is leave them alone. If you think they're in danger, put them up into the nearest tree, but unless they're, as long as they're healthy, leave them alone. Yeah, they're not pets. Leave them in the wild. They're yeah. not pets. Okay. Great. Ian, lovely to meet you. Thank, Thank you so much, Dean. I won't shake. Uh, Christine, uh, incidentally, is no stranger to owls because back in Northern Ireland, she is, in fact, she doesn't mean to boast, but a patron <laughs> of World of Owls. I'm very proud <laughs> of that. Here's the website, well worth a look. Click on Celebrity Friends and we see here Christine <laughs> holding an owl. Oh. Other fans. Oh include Terry Notkins <laughs> there and uh, Robin Asquith, if you don't mind, star of Confessions of a Window Cleaner, a specialist film from the 70s. See, I am up there with the best of them. It's a proud moment for me, yeah. Oh, <laughs> Thank you, Ellie, as well. Um, ben, tell us about... I know it's odd talking oh, about your new it book is, it right. is. between two owls, but... Um, I, n I, n I never... It's a Harry Potter moment, yeah. really, exactly. isn't it? Yeah. I never publicised my work without my, uh, my, my, <laughs> my, my owls. I, uh, <laughs> God, I see it as a sort of, a sort of entrance for me. So, Blind like Faith. Blind Faith, here my it is. My assistant will hold it yes. up. It, it, it matches your top you perfectly, that was yeah. actually. We, exactly. we really think about this for that purpose. No, this, is, this, is, this is set some way in the future, isn't it? Yes, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, a, bit of a, a bit, of, bit of a hellish vision of the future. Uh, uh, um, based on, I, I suppose, uh, my kind of satirical and, and indeed uh, quite, quite serious yeah. uh, fears about the way we've come to sort of see faith as something which is, is worthy of respect 
per se that if someone believes something or claims it's their faith, it is therefore immediately has a, has a kind of higher moral value than something that can be intellectually discussed. Or so proved. the faith here is what? There's faith it's in. It's anything. I mean, this isn't a book about fundamentalist religion. Yeah. It's not about Islam. It's not about fundamental yeah. Christianity. It's about the idea that if somebody feels something or believes something, it is inherently of more value than something that you can work out. It's kind of about lazy thinking, really. But it's a it's quite a sort of uh, it's quite a sort of heavy satire. But these owls, particularly that one, are absolutely riveted. Exactly. Just staring well, at they're you very there. wise, you see. They love, <laughs> they, love a, they love a good book. Uh, one, one of the features of the book is that the a lot of the kids in a lot of the people in there have got ludicrous names. Um, well, it's you know, it's a lot of fun with what what Happy you know. Meal, Chantoria, Cresta <laughs> Fiesta, which, which scans beautifully. I must say. Exactly. I think you, there will be people soon called Happy Meal and, and Cresta Fiesta. I mean, it, it's look. It, if you look into the future, it's always really about the present. And certainly, uh, uh, I do have a bit of fun yeah. with the, the current sort of craze for sort of weird names. Yes. What did, what's Jordan's new one? Princess exactly. Tiramisu Princess something or something? Or other, but sure yeah, well, when it comes to giving <laughs> kids daft names, just how close, in fact, is Ben's fiction to the truth? Never mind 150 years in the future. There are plenty of daft names to conjure with in the here and now. We send Justin Rowlett to Ben's hometown of Catford to investigate. <laughs> One of the most difficult decisions...